Hello, everybody. I wanted to give you a brief lecture on feminist biblical interpretation. This lecture is based on the article that uh, is in the book Bread Not Stone, this classic collection of essays by Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza was published first in 1985 and then again 10 years later in the anniversary edition and I suspect we'll be seeing a 30th anniversary edition perhaps coming out this year I thought there was one I couldn't find it on Amazon but I'm sure uh, I'm sure it's coming and the work a uh, women church is uh, of essential importance in this uh, collected volume of essays and I'm going to be talking a little bit about that today. The essay lays out the need for feminist biblical interpretation as a form of liberation theology. And the notion is that women uh, and men are caught up in a system of patriarchal oppression. The women of the Bible, of course, uh, lived in a very patriarchal society, but really the Bible has been interpreted dominantly, predominantly, by men, for men, um, in the centuries uh, immediately leading up to current times. So really until the 1960s there was no notion that uh, one ought to read the Bible from a woman's perspective. But this isn't just androcentricism. It's the idea that there is a socio-political system and social structure of subjugation and oppression that keeps women down and keeps other peoples down, too. And so women have an affinity, first world women may have an affinity with third world peoples who are feeling like they are projected as the other. So, so the idea is that we're all caught up in this pyramidal uh, hierarchical structure that basically favors uh, men. And whether that's good or not, um, well, it's, it's not good. It's not even good for the oppressor to be part of that system. So, so what do we do with that? What do we do with the reality that the Bible came out of a patriarchal system and has been predominantly interpreted by men in... Uh, functioning with the privileges of the patriarchal society and continues to be. I mean, this, this hasn't stopped. When, when I go to the Society of Biblical Literature, I see a huge dominance of, of older white men, um, people like myself. Um, the field is still strongly male-dominant, uh, and, and recovering women's voices is not necessarily a concern for a lot of men. Um, trying to understand the perspective of the text for women is not necessarily the concern for many of these male interpreters. Now, feminist biblical interpretation has its roots in historical criticism, which emerged in the modern era, so emerged right with in, hand in hand with the Enlightenment. And historical criticism uh, tried to liberate the Bible from um, the dominant doctrinal mode of interpretation that was favored by uh, the church, the Catholic Church certainly, but favored by the church all the way through the Middle Ages and into, uh, into the Renaissance era. Um, historical criticism went behind the text to find out what the historical truth might be and uncovered a lot of interesting things that, that the doctrinal critics had probably suppressed for, for quite some time. Um, and feminist biblical interpretation has its roots in this historical critical uh, mode. Um, it recognizes that as a historical piece, the Bible is stamped by patriarchal oppression. The Bible comes out of a society with a strong sense of patriarchy. And so it, it tries to get at, feminist biblical interpretation does, it tries to get at what actually might have happened. Is there some historical factual model that we can, we can find out what happened to the women? Surely there can't be so few women in that period of time. Something must have happened, well, with all the male writers, with all the male editors, 
um, the women's voices, the women's roles got forgotten or got written out of the story. Um, the other affinity that feminist biblical interpretation has is with the dialogical pluralistic model, the idea that there are multiple uh, texts in uh, the Bible, and many of them speak to many different communities, and, and in fact that you might have the same text speaking in different ways to different two, two different communities. You might have the same text that would read very differently for a community of inmates than it might read for a community of wealthy uh, suburban um, Methodist, you know, so you might have a completely different perspective on the text, and it recognizes the notion that we all operate with a canon within a canon, that there are texts that we favor over others that become then uh, dominant in, in our reading of the others, and so it operates with this idea that some texts may be more important than others. Now, it begins, though, however, with the woman's experience and their struggle for liberation. So the canon that liberation theologians is not that that biblical uh, that, that feminist liberation theologians use is not necessarily selected from uh, four or five texts that they find in the Bible that that sort of favor women, but rather the canon, the rule is is the is the experience of women who are trying to liberate themselves and others from from uh, racism, sexism, poverty, other oppressive systems that are part of patriarchy. It shares that experience with other liberative uh, movements. So the Bible is not necessarily the normative source, the authoritative source, but it's a resource, a theological resource in getting at the women's struggle for uh, liberation. Now, the stunning part of this article, and I think what's probably very useful for us as we dig into texts, is to have this idea that, that feminist biblical interpretation operates with basically four different moves or four different methods. The first is the hermeneutics of suspicion. Hermeneutics of suspicion looks at the text as a product of an androcentric and patriarchal society, and so it questions whether the text has somehow covered up the role of women. Have women's voices been diminished? Have the roles of women been forgotten? Um, have um, oftentimes you'll have women characters placed in a, a certain um, a position in the story um, that may not be fortuitous, that may not be um, highly, um, it may not make the woman look good. Right? It may it may make women look bad or silly or strange. Right? So it 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 suspects that somehow the dominant role is is that, you know, men just sort of ignore women. And a lot of times that the text may have universal appeal, but it's just addressed to men. Right? But but it might be that all all people could relate to it. So hermeneutics of suspicion tries to, to get at how the text might have covered over what actually may have happened or the role that women may have played or even silenced women's voices. Hermeneutics of proclamation assumes that there is some theological value in the text. It, and, and in this sense, it, it may be that the text can be normative for communities. It can be scripture. The question it asks, though, is what can we do with these texts where women seem to be oppressed? Do we read these texts? Do we teach them? Do we preach them? And the answer is that oppressive texts and traditions have to be denounced, even perhaps um, excised from the lectionary. Perhaps it's not valuable for our communities to read them. On the other hand, we might find in these texts that even though they're patriarchal, they can come to a community with a liberating vision that can be taught and preached. And so there is a way of articulating that vision, and um, we can look for that and find a way to relate it to the needs of a contemporary audience. The hermeneutics of remembrance is basically a historical critical move, and it tries to dig down beneath the layers of 
of, of, of patriarchal redaction and interpretation to recover and re reconstruct the history of biblical women. There were women in that society. Perhaps the men didn't give voice to their needs and their experiences or their roles that they played in shaping community, but is there a way to remember and highlight the contributions of women? And then further, the hermeneutics of creative actualization. Because so many, so often the story has been oppressed or lost or diminished or silenced, maybe as we engage the text historically, we need to also engage it with our imagination, with liturgy and with art, to sort of recover what the women might have been thinking or feeling or experiencing that are portrayed in the text, in the text, through the text. Now, I don't know that one is necessarily unable to do the hermeneutics of remembrance or creative actualization if one has already determined the text to be an oppressive text. There may still be room for it, but, but that's really where the big question is. Do we look at a text like Judges 19 and say, you know, this is beyond the pale, this is a text that is not fruitful for reading. This is a text that's not fruitful for teaching or preaching. Or is there a way to recover the voice of the woman in the text for a way that does offer a liberative theological perspective? Is God in the text at all? These are hard questions. These are very hard questions, and I hope you think through them very hard because this text, especially the Old Testament, sometimes can be very almost uh, almost attacking women, almost, I mean, very, very opposed to women, very oppressive. And we have to reckon with that. And we have to think through our theology and how we're going to interpret, to interpret these texts, whether we're going to interpret them. Thank you very much, and, and I hope you all have something to think about.